Hey guys, Chris here, and I'm a Ukrainian Canadian. Today is November 6, 2022, and let's get over the news happening in Ukraine, shall we? So today I have an update in Kherson and as well in the Donetsk Luhansk fronts. So first of all, I want to start with Kherson. So today um, there's essentially a map that was uh, thrown around and uh, it's alleged positions of the Russians in the city itself of Kherson. And you can see here, these are checkpoints, bases, and uh, command posts that are deployed in the city itself. And uh, these, you know, this information was given by partisans, most likely people that, you know, are pro-Ukrainian still living in the city. And it indicates that the Russians are indeed planning to um, perhaps and very likely to fight, uh, have some urban fighting within the city. So they're not planning to give it out. And as I've said, I think that they're going to really try to maximize the amount of losses for the Ukrainians on the right bank of Kherson. So this area, um, again, I think the Russians are realizing that the open steps and the open fields are really hard to defend long term. They're not going to be able to do that. They've lost all the bridges that connect to Kherson. Uh, obviously, Antonivsky Bridge, which is here, and the Novakakhovka Dam, and the only way they can transport goods is through barges and pontoon bridges, which is not very effective for them. And so I think that they're really trying to reinforce the positions that are um, advantageous for the Russians. So Kherson City and, you know, the... Um, the coastal region, uh, the coastal areas uh, by the Dnipro River. So I think that's what the long-term game is for the Russians. You really want to make sure that the Ukrainians are going to be paying for it uh, as we move through the region. I think within the next few months, it's going to happen. We're going to take vast amounts of territory here. Um, and we're going to get to Kherson city by the end of this year. And... Um, as we've seen here, they've really established a lot of defenses around the the river and really closer to um, you know the la left bank. So essentially, I think that they're really planning to give uh, give a, a big fight to where they seem to think uh, there is advantages for them. So it would be interesting to see what's going to happen next few weeks. But uh, again. Uh, as I've said in my previous video yesterday, the Russians were planning or have uh, retreated from Chornobaevka and outside settlements of the city. So I think that they're trying to really reinforce uh, the urban center of Kherson and as well uh, the other side of the river so they can have a clear you know, view of the Ukrainians once we get to uh, Kherson and then Novakakhovka, Kozatske, all this area around here. So it'll be interesting to see, as I've said, but... Um, the Russians are not planning to give it up that easily, and they really want to make sure that we pay the price for it. And I think once we get all this territory and we actually start crossing uh, the river, because we have no choice, we're going to take back everything we have to take back. Uh, it's our territory. We deserve it. And um, the Russians will probably consider then flooding the dam uh, if they have the possibility of detonating this dam. They probably, if they really have to retreat from this side, uh, back to Crimea, then they'll probably flood it because there have been maps uh, thrown around that if they destroy this dam, it's actually going to hurt more the left bank than the right bank because this is a much more, in terms of topographies, if we look here, right, you have some hills. I mean, Kherson is very flat, but you can see that in the city itself, there's still like a higher ground compared to the left bank. So this area is going to be much worse hit compared to the right bank. So only if the Russians are really going to start retreating from the left bank, uh, they might potentially uh, destroy the dam, in my opinion, if they can do it as well, if they have some remote control detonations or whatever. So it'll be interesting to see that, what's going to happen. In other news, uh, and this is a big one, a battalion, a whole battalion, so about 600 men of Russian draftees were wiped out near Ukraine's Makivka. And uh, one survivor obviously had the testimony, was able to survive and, uh, you know, confirm that. So basically, this was uh, Russian draft draftees from uh, Voronezh region, and uh, they were deployed in the Makivka city. And so the man says that his battalion arrived on the front line in the early hours of the second uh, November 2nd, which is literally a few days ago, guys. It was like four days ago. And he says that they sent us there and told us to dig trenches. We only had three shovels for the entire battalion. Three shovels. Just take that in. Three shovels. They can't even make, produce, and give shovels to their soldiers. We had no equipment at all. We dug what we could. And by the morning, the Ukrainians started firing at us from artillery, artillery grads, mortars, drones. They shot to kill. 
the officers immediately ran away. Hmm. Between the attacks, we tried to dig trenches, but we were detected by drones and they shot at us. Out of 570 people, so 600 men almost, 29 survived, 12 are injured, the rest are gone, thus dead. It's unbelievable. If we look at the map here, Makivka is uh, in the Donetsk front. So let me just zoom in a little bit around, uh, where is Makivka? I believe it is right here, yes. The Luhansk front, I should say. So the Russians uh, essentially were told to push here, dig trenches, you know, and uh, that's exactly what I said in my previous video. These mobilized men are just cannon fodder. Um, they're being sent out to die, and the commands, the commanders have no idea what they're doing as well. They're just telling them, dig trenches, you know, establish a position here, but they have no equipment, they have nothing um, that they can do to fight off, you know, the Ukrainians. So, you know, there's going to be multiple waves of these men just constantly being pushed out, and they have no idea what they're doing. So, 600 men dead in one day here. Um, a couple of days ago. That's why I think um, a couple of days ago, there was a really, really high number, about a thousand soldiers almost dead. I think either November 2nd or 3rd, uh, which corresponds with, you know, uh, this big loss that they had in Makivka in this region. So, um, and again, you know, you see that uh, the, the Russians had to get higher ground, so they had to go up. And we have higher ground here, so there's two, like... Um, you know, kind of hills here. And so we had the higher ground. So we had easy, uh, it was easy for us to pick him off here, you know, around this area. Um, so it was a disaster for the Russians, but again, uh, more disasters to come. These draftees are going to come in waves and the Russian command, as you've seen, are just going to, uh, you know, uh, they're going to flee and going to leave their soldiers to die as always with three shovels. That's all they had in terms of equipment. And in other news as well, with all these losses happening, uh, Russia's catastrophic missing man problem. So the urban professionals who could gladly avoid thinking about the war over the summer got a rude awakening when the Kremlin started pressing them into military service. The ranks of Moscow's intelligentsia, who often have disposable income and passports for foreign travel, have thinned noticeably in restaurants, in the hipster community, and at social gatherings like dinners and parties. But ethnic and religious minorities in some regions have it worse. So obviously, the people that had the money, they had the lifestyle um, and the ability uh, to flee Russia when the mobilization came about, they did so. And we've heard reports that about a million Russian men fled since uh, end of September. But the ethnic and religious minorities that literally don't have the money to even you know, move cities in Russia domestically had no choice but to fight. And uh, they were mobilized and uh, they're the ones who you know, are bearing the brunt or I should say are, um, you know, dying in mass because they obviously have no opportunity to move away from Russia. And in the meantime, uh, downloads of dating apps have significantly increased in the countries, uh, in the country, um, in the countries to which Russian men fled. So, uh, and there's a sharp rise in downloads in Armenia, Georgia, Turkey, and Kazakhstan. All the most reasonable guys are gone, said Tatiana, uh, a 36-year-old Muscovite. So essentially, these men are downloading the apps in foreign countries where they moved into. But in Russia itself, the women are struggling to date uh, because obviously there's a lot of deaths, a lot of men have fled. And so these are also the child-bearing men, right? The, the younger generation of 18 to 30 are completely uh, gone, almost completely gone, right? So this is really going to hurt Russia's population down the line. Um, again, it's going to be catastrophic. And as well, Ukraine's uh, population as well. It's it's very... Um, it's, it's a relationship between both of the countries, right? What hap happens in Russia, it's very similar to Ukraine because obviously Russia is attacking Ukraine. So it's also a huge problem in Ukraine. We have mobilized men. We have uh, childbearing men dying as well um, in Ukraine. So it's really a difficult situation in terms of the demography and uh, it's only worsening the uh, the gender ratio in both countries, right? There's going to be way more women than men. And that was the case previously to this war. And now it's only going to exacerbate this problem, unfortunately. 
In other news, the German Gepherds are proven effective. So these are uh, these Gepherds were built in 1970s, and they were phased out by the German army in about the 2010s. Uh, so they don't really have much use for them anymore. So they're just proven super effective against slow drones, the Iranian Shahids. Um, and uh, Kiev is saying that they're super effective against the drones because they are not super fast. Um, and so these Gepherds are very uh, good to track them and uh, destroy them very quickly. And uh, these cannons are 35 millimeter cannons, if I'm not mistaken. So they're very powerful. And, um, you know, Kiev's asking for more of them. So hopefully the Germans will send us more Gepherds because they're proven to be extremely effective against, you know, slow drones like the Shahids and the other ones that Russia has currently. So, um, the other thing I wanted to show you guys is a few videos, so let's get to it before I finish. So this is Bakhmut, this is how the front line looks like, um, just a quick video, uh, I turned the audio off because there's music, but uh, just to show you guys, you know, these guys are getting prepared for an attack, you know, and they have their monster energy drinks, uh, but you can see how well prepared and well equipped our soldiers are compared to the mobilized men, even the Russian uh, typical soldiers, like we have all the kits, the first aid kits, um, you know, we look uh, well prepared, we have high morale, and we know what we're fighting for. So this is what we're going to win. There's no doubt about it. You can see the morale is high. And all these men uh, are really, really well equipped with good uh, bulletproof vests. And you can see that the city itself in Bakhmut is completely wiped out. Uh, it doesn't look like a city anymore, unfortunately. Um, you know, surprisingly, this building looks relatively untouched, but uh, Bakhmut itself is is unhab uninhabitable, unfortunately, at this point. Uh, so that's that. And uh, these are our, our forces, and I believe it's unconfirmed where it is. It's Ukrainian offensive. It's just a quick video of our man uh, moving behind a BMP, uh, APC. Uh, you know, and I believe this is in Kherson. If we look at this, this is somewhere in Kherson. We're moving through open fields. Only in Kherson you would see such vast open fields without any tree cover. Very dangerous and uh, Godspeed to our soldiers, uh, you know, fighting for our territory, for our democracy. But uh, again, we're, we're really, we're doing the right tactics. We're hiding behind the BMPs with, you know, infantry support. This is how uh, an offensive should be conducted. And this is a sad video, uh, you know, I always want to remind my viewers about the uh, human disaster and the genocide that the Russians have caused in Mariupol. Um, this is a video about uh, Mariupol and how the city looks like right now. Despite what the Russians try to say, that they're rebuilding the city, they're fully planning to restore, you know, the beauty of Mariupol, none of that is going to happen. You can see entire blocks have been wiped out. Nobody lives in them anymore. Um, it's horrifying. And it's not surprising that, you know, about 100,000 of our civilian people living there have died due to indiscriminate shelling by the Russians. Entire blocks completely destroyed. Completely destroyed. Yep. Yeah, it's... Sorry for the wind noise in that video, but... It wasn't taken from the best quality camera, I believe. Anyways, you guys get the point. The Russians just wiped out the city off the map. Um, that's their tactics, and that's why the Ukrainians are fighting, because we know that the Russians, if they come to other cities, Aporizhia, Kiev, you know, Dnipropetrovsk, or now Dnipro, uh, they're going to do the same. They're going to do the same stuff. They're going to wipe out these cities off the map, because that's the only thing Russians know how what to do, is to just destroy and loot and do terrific, hor horrific things, unfortunately. And uh, last video, this are these are Russian soldiers that uh, were, you know, buried in Luhansk somewhere. This is a sidewalk. It looks like a sidewalk. You can see VDV flags 
uh, I think this is a Vedave flag right over there. They were literally littering our sidewalks with their Russian dead soldiers. This war is horrifying, you know, just uh, people don't understand the scale of death here. It's not some small scale, you know, conflict. This is a mass, massive scale conflict between two huge countries, Russia and Ukraine. Um, yeah, I mean, this is in Luhansk somewhere on the sidewalk, you know, and I can count perhaps hundreds of soldiers probably uh, just from this video alone. So it's terrifying to see. You know, and for a senseless war, all these Russian men were sent to to die in a in a useless war that wasn't you know necessary in the first place. <sighs> yeah, so that's it for, for that's it for now, guys. I uh, appreciate you watching my video. Um, please leave a comment if you enjoy. If you have anything else you wanna you know uh, share with me, please subscribe to my channel. I really appreciate your support. And again, please donate. If you have excess, you know, funds, uh, please donate to any Ukraine causes. It really is going to help us towards victory against an evil Russian regime. So I appreciate your support. Please subscribe to my channel if you like my content. And uh, I'll see you guys in the next video. Thank you so much.